Hare Krishna, Rasmandal Prabhu. Welcome back to the Monks Podcast. Hare Krishna, Chaitanya Charam Prabhu. Thank you for having me again. It's not only I am I honored and grateful for you to be here. I was especially delighted that you took such an active interest in the last podcast that you also responded personally to comments on that podcast. It just shows that it really brings out the you could say the compassionate teacher in you that. You do, you're really concerned that the subject be understood and if somebody has questions, the questions be addressed. So I'm really grateful for that. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I'm not sure my motives are always quite as benign as they should be. Um, but I, yeah, it, it is good to have that conversation and to promote constructive dialogue. And I'm grateful to those uh, devotees who took part in that, yeah, yeah. including yourself, yeah. Thank you. So I thought that uh, we could build today on the previous podcast that we had on ethics. And uh, so I'll summarize and then you can also add some things in the summary if you like, and then we will take it forward. So ethics is a very important subject. And we based our discussion based uh, using your paper and a broad discussion about you know, why is ethics important? We have our philosophy. But philosophy is more about, say, the ontology nature of reality. But how is that reality to be translated in our actions in daily life? And um, some, and this applies both to, as devotees, we have to make decisions in our devotional interactions. Sometimes um, we may, we may, if we place spirituality as above morality entirely, then spirituality becomes like a moral void. And morality mm. also becomes devalued. So the mm. Gita does talk about ethics a lot. It's not just talking about spirituality. It's mm. an ethical discussion about the right thing to do. Mm. And so <clears throat> devotees may sometimes, uh, the devotee leaders, devotee, individual devotees also, may, if they prioritize only spirituality, then ethical shortcuts may be taken. Sometimes intentionally, many times, even unintentionally also. Mm. And mm. also, uh, if customized ethics for different people in different roles are not recognized, then only generic spiritual ethics or spiritual values, not ethics values. If generic mm -hmm. spiritual values only are emphasized, then say that everybody should chant and everybody should do their sadhana and that will solve all problems. But then for specific roles in society, specific mm -hmm. uh, virtues, specific uh, are required. And mm -hmm. the development of that, if it is, uh, if it is not given adequate attention, then uh, we may not be able to function properly as a movement. So we mm. talked about governance, how governance requires ethics. And otherwise, uh, we cannot function well. And then after, apart from that also, that also in, we function in a world uh, as devotees. We're not just living, interacting with each other. We are interacting with the world. And in the world, there are many ethically complex issues in which mm. we cannot just give black and white answers. Mm. We have to mm. understand the issues and then come up with the tangible contributions. So mm. right now, for the mainstream ethical discourse, we are largely irrelevant. We are often seen as irrelevant or even inconsequential. So mm. some amount of training in ethics and how, how to engage in ethics is required, at least for those devotees in responsible positions. Mm. And uh, this, of course, can be formed based on our own tradition our resources from our tradition, but sustained attention is required for that to develop the ethics, not simply that we quote verses to mm -hmm. resolve or as, as uh, easy solutions to eth ethical issues. Mm -hmm. So an ethical theory has to be built. So that was the broad, uh, broad subject that we discussed. You also mentioned something about the modes that then goodness, uh, goodness is also important, even if transcendence is there. And even passion is important. Passion is better than ignorance, as Bhaktivinoda Thakur talks about it being material mm. neutral. So these values, we cannot devalue them. If, and that's what will happen if we don't give due attention to ethics. And mm. by proper attention to ethics, not only can, as, as a movement, we function more, uh, more harmoniously, but also we can, as a, as, a, as a missionary movement, we can also become more relevant and reach out to more people in the world. Mm -hmm. So, any other points, Prabhu? 
No, I think that's a great summary. Thank you. Yeah, I did mention, of course, that there's there's three areas we could apply oh. ethical discourse. One is which which I liken to just very briefly. I likened it to three values. From the three values listed by Bhaktivinoda Thakur, I kind of extrapolated a little bit to suggest there are three arenas. So there's um, the first value I think he gave is Nama Ruchi. So there is a moral dimension to our relationship with Krishna, if you like. Um, the second virtue he mentioned, and these are only, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is just a broad fit analysis. Um, it's not necessarily extremely tight where each virtue is restricted to that particular arena. Um, but the second arena is, uh, and it's mentioned in the first canto, second chapter, how the taste for the holy name is contingent on service to the Vaishnavas. Mm. So, so uh, that's in the second chapter of the first canto, and I've forgotten the actual number of the verse. Uh, by service to the Vaishnavas, great service is done, and by such service one develops a taste for the holy name of the Lord. So the second arena um, suggested by Vaishnava Seva is the community, the devotional community. Mm. And then Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur also mentioned a third value, which is Jiva Doya. And he suggests that without such compassion, one's bhakti is merely a semblance. It's not authentic. So uh, my conclusion was from this discussion is that we need to give attention to all three domains, to all three areas. The relationship we have with the Supreme Lord, uh, the relationship we have through other devotees, and particularly in the, I think, the development and leadership of communities, and thirdly, in our outreach and how we can actually effectively address uh, moral issues in our outreach and make it meaningful to others. Hmm. That's true. That's, that's, so that's, that's something else just to add to, to what yeah, you yeah, said. We didn't good. discuss that. I found that particular analysis of uh, the uh, the analysis of action is very striking that as devotees when we talk about Na Vaishnava Seva and Jiva Daya we only talk about that in some in some stereotype activities that okay Vaishnava yes. Seva means you know feed devotees or help them in some services or Jiva Daya means distribute books or invite people to temples but the way you explained it is that this means that we act in a way that uh, that is actually helpful for them and that involves ethical conduct so it's easy yes. to do something like sir prasad to some devotee is easy but in sustained relationship to act in a way that that relationship becomes in, in become sustained and healthy ethics will be important and jivdaya Absolutely. also so it's it that i made a point last time also that how ethics permeates the entire ambit of krishna consciousness so we may be very compassionate in inviting people to come to Krishna and providing them facilities. But if they find that the conduct of devotees is not ethical, ethically, ethically mm. upright, ethically sound, then the people mm. may come, but then they will get alienated and they will go away. So yes. that's true. Yeah. Also, of course, you discussed at the beginning about, <clears throat> about how <clears throat> knowing, doing and being, knowledge, skills and values. And that mm. also... Mm, Prabhupada talked about in the seven purposes of ISKCON about imbalance of values has to be corrected by sharing knowledge. So in that sense, yes. Prabhupada also wanted to establish ethics. Yes. So, you know, I thought today we could discuss, we could build on that subject and then our mm. previous podcast is also available for participants to watch as well as a summary in that, which will provide links for them. So, <clears throat> you no. Know, now, maybe if uh, last time you mentioned this briefly, that mm. morality and ethics, mm. uh, is there a difference between those and how can that be, say, more clearly understood? Because also these words have connotations. Sometimes the word morality has a little bit negative connotation. You are moral, moralizing or doing moral policing. Uh, eth mm. Ethics seems to be something which is very accepted. There are corporate ethics. There is even sports ethics. There are political ethics. Mm -hmm. Ethics seems to be a universally accepted, uh, almost necessity, even in today's world. So how yes. do we differentiate between the two? Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a very good <laughs> question. And, and perhaps that preliminary understanding 
uh, is helpful to clarify even some of the discussions we had on your last podcast. Some scholars suggest using the words morality and ethics and some of their corollaries such as morals or ethical um, synonymously, they have the same meaning. My own view on that um, is there's a danger of somehow blunting uh, discernment by using the two words uh, entirely, uh, considering them both coterminous, they, they're synonymous. The, any dictionary will give you several meanings of each of the words, mm -hmm. morality and ethics and their corollaries. Um, and some of them are synonymous, but some of them are quite different. And the way that I like to define it, and for practical purposes, I, I, I have defined it that way. Um, I'm just trying to find my notes here, actually, which I will have to come to in a minute. Um, is that uh, morality is anything to do with the difference between right and wrong or between good and evil. Okay. And, and by the way, those two ways of framing morality represent different approaches, um, the latter being more associated with virtue ethics, as, as we'll come to later. Um, but anything to do with right or wrong or good or evil or virtuous and vicious. Um, the word ethics um, refers more, as I use it, to the more deliberate or conscious um, consideration and application of moral rules, principles, and so on. In other words, it's kind of a step above. Um, there, and there are two specific meanings of ethics that indicate this. The first is the use of ethics to refer to moral philosophy, which goes back, of course, to the ancient Greeks and according to modern scholarship, now to many other pre-modern societies, such as the African, the, the Chinese with their Confucianism, um, the Indian included. Um, so there isn't that just that kind of rather, rather too narrowly circumscribed understanding of ancient philosophy as being only Greek or having its roots only in Greek thought. So ethics can mean moral philosophy, uh, which kind of more recently emerged as a distinctive discipline in Western academic space, in Western universities. Um, the second meaning, as you alluded to, is when it refers to professional codes of conduct as refer to medicine, psychology, business, and you mentioned, I think, sport. Yeah, corporate sports. Well, sport, sport, for example, one would hope that chivalry was a, um, a, a, a virtue. And perhaps these days we might look to a little um, humility as well. I don't know whether that's can be used to complement the, the one that's obvious, which is courage, for example, in sporting yes. activities is, is very important. Um, so it refers first to moral philosophy and then to certain professional codes of conduct, medicine, psychology, law, um, sport, as we mentioned, or to any kind of subgenre of, mor of moral philosophy, such as environmental ethics. Okay. So that's the kind of genre of moral philosophy that focuses on some specific issues to do with the environment rather than all the other issues that are there. Uh, oh, bioethics yeah. recently yeah. been popular. Mm. That's a quite a good classification. So when you're saying as a philosophy and with genres within the philosophy, it's more like a rationally developed uh, uh, system of thought where yes. in, which can provide subsequently directions for acting. Whereas uh, in say in sports ethics or corporate ethics, it would also, when we talk about code of conduct, it's more of very specific directives also. It might not involve so much, a code of conduct is not. So it also has some intellectual dimensions to it, but it's not so much a de well-developed system of thought as it is 
a specific set of directions? Well, I'm saying it actually belongs to the field of ethics. It is more deliberate. It may not quite be so philosophical, okay. but it certainly, re it certainly requires collaborative reflection. Yes, uh, and, therefore, yeah. and therefore, if, whereas morality itself, one, you know, morality pervades all aspects of life. It's all pervasive. Um, and one sometimes has difficulty deciding what is, what, is, what is a moral issue and what's not a moral issue. It's so broad. But uh, even though it's so broad, we do have to differentiate. We can't say morality is everything, but it does seem to pervade many aspects of life, uh, somewhat depending on which approach to morality you take, of course. Um, but one can, one can have some kind of moral sense and sensibility without ne necessarily reflecting too much on it. One may just simply use one's moral sense to criticize others all the time. Uh, there may be some lack of reflection there. So ethics refers really more to that conscious, uh, deliberate, and sometimes systemized reflection on moral issues. So there's morality and ethics. I so in a sense, ethics stands a level above morality. Yes, thank you. It look, it's looking at it, it has a reflective approach. Um, the third term I want to introduce here is hermeneutics, which is the science of interpretation. It's in the Western academic space. It usually refers to uh, the disciplines of law, where you have to interpret the law, uh, to literature and to religion. Um, in our own tradition, uh, the word mamangsa is often identified with scriptural interpretation. Um, so I, I don't want to get it too much into the, that term now, but because of certain practical issues within ISKCON now, um, and I'll discuss this later regarding the interpretation of Srila Prabhupada's books and some of his controversial statements, I will discuss it later. Um, there are certain ethical dimensions to hermeneutics and particularly something that Simon Blackburn, a well-known um, British um, moral philosopher talks about, as do others, it, it, he talks about the moral climate or the ethical environment. It's the kind of ethos and surrounding environment of ideas um, that we're all susceptible to and which somehow determine to a great extent um, our moral responses. So the ethical environment has changed significantly from the 1960s, the era, the decade of ISKCON's incorporation to the 2020, 2020s mm -hmm. uh, now, um, um, and where we've got a very, um, well, I won't go into, into detail, but we've got a highly polarized, um, quite vicious debate or, or vicious debates going on, um, even by those who are suggesting they're interested in virtue. So the quality of the debate needs to be looked at and, and some of the moral uh, insights and perhaps more importantly, some of the moral assumptions that are made in particularly popular or populist discourse, though don't always stand up very well to, to scrutiny. Uh, and, and scrutiny often reveals some inconsistencies in the moral discourse and in the moral perspective some people have. And, and that's very useful. And I'll come to that later by suggesting we need to have all of us, um, whether we're involved in the populist discourse or whether we're members of a religious institution or whatever, uh, it's useful to actually move from having assumptions about morality, um, although personal insights may be, may be important, personal intuition may be important and has been much discussed in moral philosophy, but also having that approach which gives attention to ethics rather than simply thinking um, we have our personal moral insight and that's good enough. Okay. So three, three, so three terms really I'm defining them, That's morality, ethics, and I think we also need to look at um, the ethical dimensions of hermeneutics, which are sometimes ignored. 
But I don't want to get into that in too much detail at the moment, unless you've got any questions about that, of course, that helps clarify. Okay, I'm just trying to, you know, if we consider this to be, it's almost like if there is a building and there is a foundation to it. So it may not be a, a very precise metaphor, but in general, the choices that we make, how should I do this? Should I do that? that is reflected in and say that is the code of conduct but the code of conduct is based on a philosophy that might not be very well examined that we might not be even understood but we all have some kind of philosophy and when we even artic articulate or develop that philosophy we have certain assumptions which are addressed by hermeneutics so in one sense we could say each of these three is like a these three are interrelated layers all of them are connected quite uh, uh, so if you want to discuss hermeneutics, then probably we have to go much deeper. When we want to discuss philosophy, uh, then also we need to go deep. And then for most people, it's, it's, it's like sometimes we feel that this particular action is wrong, but we may not be able to explain why it is wrong or we may feel that something is right. So not so in one sense, we have, you could say, a uh, uh, I'm not saying it's always right, but we have a conscience or a, because an intuitive ethical sense, which tells us what is right and what is wrong. Again, this may not always be guiding us properly, but to understand or to articulate why something, something is right or something is wrong, uh, we need to be able to have a well-developed well system of thought. So yep. I'm, I'm, I'm on the right track in understanding what yeah. you said. Precisely. And later I'll come to this because um, you've mentioned rules and conduct or codes of conduct, which are more or less rules. So, uh, you know, how useful are rules and what happens when rules break down? Um, hmm. a, a kind of phenomenon for which the Bhagavad Gita is a, a, a prime example, where Arjuna um, somehow was bewildered in trying to apply rules in the specific context in which he found himself. And all of us, uh, if we're just slightly reflective, and this will apply to all, or at least most devotees, um, you know, we find that actually rules at times break down. Um, if I'm walking in the, in, 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 and it's, it, 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 I see a sannyasi, the rule is I should either pay my obeisances, my dandavats, um, first thing, or fast for the rest of the day if I fail to do that? What happens if it's raining? What happens if you know that the sannyasi in question will pay obeisances to us in return, as many will do in, under, in, in some contexts, uh, and they're in a hurry? <laughs> what do we do then? I'm just trying to give one example that okay. from my own life of when we are faced with dilemmas. Um, and when the dilemmas come, obviously rules very, very quickly break down. And I am going to later in this um, podcast give a, a kind of overview of, of, of what our moral philosophy may be with reference to rules and reason and, and going further as well. So perhaps uh, I could discuss that or we could discuss that later if, if that's possible. Yes. So this also, I think, it's with the, in our, in Bhakti, in Upadesha the Nectar of Instruction, this is where the concept of Niyamagraha comes in. That Absolutely. deciding what is a, when to stick to the letter of the law or when to focus on its spirit, that also requires ethical reflection. Isn't Absolutely. It? Yes, yes. So, so that and, would, and, and, yeah. Hmm. So would that come at the level of philosophy? Uh, or can, 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 we, can we come to that later? Because yeah, what I'd like to do is definitely. discuss that. Yes, please um, and, yeah. and perhaps it'd be useful to move ahead, but yeah. hold on to that. I don't, don't want you to lose that question, but I think actually it would be probably useful because okay. to discuss it later. So maybe once we've got this difference between morality and ethics clear, uh, we discussed this briefly in the previous session, but and why do we as devotees, especially, as, or especially leaders, uh, we need to focus on moral ethical issues and not just on spiritual topics. I think we uh, we discussed some things for both that when you yeah. talk about the ambit of Vaishnava Seva and Jiva Daya. But maybe some more specific examples would you like to give? 
to well, I'd, like, I'd like to I'd like to summarize, and I think it's useful to summarize without going into too much detail. Um, the first one, uh, uh, and, and by the way, in analyzing these challenges we face, um, that prompted me to a large degree to differentiate between morality and ethics. Uh, and for my purposes, I there were two main challenges, and a third one later arose. The first one I call moral challenges, and those are the incidents or uh, and perhaps sometimes the um, what, what kind of confronting or shocking cases of moral turpitude, both personally and societally for ourselves. Sometimes we fail ourselves in the moral sense and we have to deal with it. Sometimes we've seen that the society has um, been prone to some yeah, rather shocking and disturbing incidents of moral turpitude. Those, so in this case, by moral issues, I'm referring to cases where our conduct clearly does not match our ideals. And how do we deal with that both personally and societally? Because it, there'll always be some kind of gap uh, and mm. philosophers have noted this. And, you know, um, there's one philosophy, uh, Dorothea Friede, who writes on virtue ethics. And she said, naturally, there's always a gap between the ideal and the real. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. Um, the question is how to address that perhaps most effectively uh, to deal with those issues when we fail to live up to our own moral and spiritual standards or when the society does that. Those are moral issues. I won't go into all the details. The early days, tactics we use on Sankatan, um, also um, the rate of divorce within ISKCON didn't match our standards regarding marriage being for life. Um, there are issues to do with leadership, failure in leadership, uh, even some accusations of corruption within leadership. And these have naturally arisen within our society, within ISKCON. Hmm? I won't go into all the details there. So um, let me understand. I, uh, let's take one example, say. So hmm. of say book distribution, if you take the example, so this is an ethical issue because of the presumption that the spiritual purpose, uh, spiritual purpose that say we are we are giving Krishna's compassion to the world, because of that because of that assumption of spiritual compassion, many times we we acted in we we means some devotee book distributors acted in ways that were unethical. So, so is that the reason why this is an ethical issue, or for yes. that matter, uh, in with respect yes. to marriages breaking down? So now this yes. is a widespread phenomena, but maybe it is because householder life was devalued as being mundane. So it is not just the so broader sociological phenomena, but it is because of the way we participated in. I mean, again, devotees uh, looked at householder life and acted in householder life. So that made the things worse. Is that how this is an ethical issue? Well, I think we need to look again. I return to the moral discourse. What is the, the environment of ideas and, and moral sensibilities in which we live? What are the kind of values we have? Uh, how do we view the Brahmachari ashram? How do we view the Krihasta ashram? Um, what are some of the possible um, what are some of the philosophical truths and also some of the philosophical misconceptions that stand behind our practices and misplaced practices? Have we, mis have we, have we misappropriated truth sometimes? Um, these are some of the, the important questions. Um, these are, they require a degree of self-criticism. Um, mm. and, and I think, again, we, we, we must recognize I mean, there's always the, the chance of actually charges of hypocrisy. And, we, and of course, you know, the Kali Yuga is known as the age of hypocrisy, which kind of suggests that if we are to actually become influential, and Srila Prabhupada has several statements on this, um, if we're going to spread Krishna consciousness, we have to avoid hypocrisy. And uh, there are several um, discussions by leading moral philosophers and what has caused 
the decline in morality, and not only that, the change in the, the quality of the moral discourse that accompanies changes in moral standing or moral status. Um, studies by such philosophers as Alistair McIntyre, mm. who suggests that we've, um, we, we've, we, we've moved away from a spirit of community towards this idea of individualism. We've lost and broken our links to tradition. And he also says we've forgotten what is the nature of man as he could be, rather than, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm using just the masculine sense, man as he, has, as he is. You know, we've lost that telos, that sense of purpose to human life. Um, others like Dorothea Friede, she actually points to some of the calamities that happened in human history. Um, and of course, the, the Second World War is one example because um, when, you know, the Allied nations learnt about the Nazi atrocities, it had a huge effect on people. Um, of course, what is sometimes not mentioned is the fact that actually the anti-Semitism that was there within Nazi German, Germany was also quite widespread in other countries as well. <laughs> uh, that is sometimes neglected, but it, it had a huge impact. And one of the reasons it had an impact is this, that actually for us who are perhaps more connected with uh, uh, history is connected with imperialism and colonialism. If we talk about people in other countries, there is this assumption, and we need to question that assumption, that they may not be civilized. So even the British were actually questioning long ago whether the Indians had any moral sensibility. Yeah. <laughs> which, is somewhat, which is something, and, and that debate, by the way, goes on and on and on. It's an important, we discuss that. Um, so I'm just trying to understand. So, 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 uh, right. so the, the, the point, the point I'm trying to make is, if if I just finish this, and I'll be very quick. Yeah. If someone who's very distant from us, or we we look down on, is immoral, it becomes very difficult. If, however, that immoral behaviour comes from a society that we can consider to be civilised, uh, and they're cultured because they listen to Wagner or whatever, and they have many um, great German philosophers, the German idealists, for example, then we start to go, we start to ask, hold on, what happened there? German is not so far from us geographically or culturally. Hmm? So it raises difficult questions. And when moral issues happen within our own society directly, uh, and we include ISKCON in this, then those questions become so far more difficult to answer or, or to sidestep or to avoid. Okay. So I'm saying there are, the, the, the issues of moral turpitude are one example. I don't want to go too long onto this because I think we need to, unless yeah. there's something, unless there's something you need to be clarified here. And, yeah, I, yeah. and by the way, the point I'm trying to make is, we don't want to, to be, we want to avoid kind of what I call rancid finger pointing and criticism, negative criticism. And these days, I think that goes too far, uh, generally, in populist moral discourse. We're always looking for faults. We, 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 certainly, we need to avoid that. Morality and, and moral reasoning is primarily for us, not for others. That's one of my... Um, precepts, if you like, one of my principles. It's primarily for us. It's for us first. But I would say, as it is for us, it may be for us personally, but it may also be for us collectively. And we want to avoid the extreme where we're denying there is any problem. There are some challenges for us. Okay. And we need to be courageous enough to look at them and to say to myself, Rasa Mandela, your moral behavior is really falling far short of a Vaishnav. And I think all of us, or, or, or someone who claims to be a Vaishnav, um, we all go through that. And it should be expected. And we need to have some kind of positive discourse 
that allows us to move on from where we are to where we should be. Hmm? Okay. So uh, avoiding both kind of the, what I call the rancid finger pointing and also, but also the denial that there are any challenges whatsoever. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just trying to understand uh, that uh, when you give practical examples, you started from the broad world and then you came to, uh, came to our movement itself. So the, the issue here is that as devotees, in fact, one of the presumptions, at least I have seen in, uh, in the devotee outreach, is that there is a presumption of ethical superiority. That, you know, that society is filled with immorality, society is filled with so much degradation, and we as devotees are going to uh, teach people how to correct that degradation. So in some ways, we could say as devotees, when we start following the four regulative principles, mm. some amount of ethical, uh, ethical conduct does come up naturally. However, there are many other aspects to ethical conduct which we may, which we may overlook. So if I understand right, what you, what you are saying is that uh, within our movement, because you also mentioned the word hypocrisy, which is quite a strong word to use, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that we, may, we may not be acting according to our own standards. And uh, that may not be simply because, say, we lack the willpower, but is it, you're saying that it also we lack the clear understanding of how to act in that situation. Because my, my question over here is that if somebody is not acting ethically, this normal understanding would be you just need to become purified. So if somebody is acting unethical, that's because of lust, anger, greed. And the solution to that is to chant Hare Krishna, come closer to Krishna, and lust, anger, greed will go away. So, and in fact, that is what we often teach. They just see how society is degraded. And if they start chanting Hare Krishna, then they'll become free from degradation. So, so why do so isn't the purification that comes from devotional practices the solution to ethical 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 improper behavior to unethical Absolutely. behavior but then, so then why, why, why what is the need for ethical uh, specific ethical reflection or ethical philosophy and it's, uh, that's one question and another thing is that you did quote a lot of uh, if it, I, I can use some some is con terminology like mundane thinkers so you know when we have the resources to pu purify ourselves and purify others you know, why do we need to look at mundane thinkers to uh, discuss about uh, to learn ethical values so um, i'm going to come to, i'm going to come to the question of uh, of why we some of us need to engage with western philosophers I'll come to that later, if I may. I think it's absolutely necessary that we do that, actually. Okay. And there are there, there are previous examples, such as Bhaktivinoda Thakur and, and our own Srila Prabhupada, uh, uh, who did so. Um, and I think it's I think it's necessary for certain, not for everyone, but for certain reasons, for certain devotees, it's necessary. And I'm going to come to that. Um, and and your previous previous point. Um, yeah. By the way, I'm not saying that any shortcoming between where we want to be and where we are is hypocrisy. But okay. it easily slips into hypocrisy if we're not careful. Um, and I think we need to be very, very aware of where we are in spiritual life individually, as well as emphasizing the goal. We need to know the ultimate tell us, but we also need to know the next step. And actually it's, it's somewhat disconcerting if not at times downfall, painful, uh, we kind of experience this existential angst sometimes when we don't reach our own values. That can be very painful. If we don't reach the values of others, that's one thing. But if we don't actually maintain conduct that matches our own values uh, or the virtues that we think are important, uh, then, then we, we feel somehow it can be quite distressing. But that is also an impetus for improvement. Now, regarding this, Srila Prabhupada does say very explicitly uh, okay, to answer your other questions, he says very explicitly in the 
uh, his purport to the 13th chapter, verses 8 to 12, which lists a number of uh, human qualities or virtues, if you like. Uh, he does say there, uh, despite using the word automatically to infer that actually through the process of bhakti, all the results, sorry, the results of all the other yogas come. I'm, I'm talking about karma yoga, jnana yoga, and, and uh, astanga yoga, um, which is normally, the last, the last one is normally associated with yoga. Um, those results come automatically, but he rejects the interpretation that automatic means or implies that we become automatons, machines, that we're non-conscious, because he says that we should deliberate on these listed virtues regularly mm. in order to assess how well we are doing spiritually. That is there. I don't have the exact reference, but if you look in the that purport, the 13th yeah. chapter, verses 8 to 12, shortly after quote, using the word automatically, maybe three or four sentences later, he, said, he, he actually refutes the idea that automatic means unconscious. That is a deliberate reflection on how am I doing in meeting these virtues. So I'd say that the other point I'm going to argue about chanting Hare Krishna brings everything. Yes, in a sense, um, the Bhagavatam asserts that those who are devotees develop all the qualities of the demigods. Now, the demigods are responsible for universal administration. One would therefore imagine that if we develop all the qualities of the demigods, we develop certain administrative qualities or the qualities that are needed for good administration. Mm. And I'm later going to discuss this because I think that um, some of the different aspects um, of ethics and morality, whether it's rules or reflection and reason, or whether it's virtue or so on, I'd like to present some kind of systemization of those. Um, those various approaches tend to be associated or with or linked to various kind of functional roles within society based on the system of four varnas. And the Chatriya class was particularly concerned with ethics and the moral status of their domain. Hmm? And Srila Prabhupada mentions that Krishna and Balaram in the Krishna book, he said, because they were Chatriyas, they studied ethics. That's an explicit quote, by the way. I may not have got the words quite right, but he said very close to that. Because they were Chatriyas, Krishna and Balaram studied ethics. Now, I'll, I'll move to that because I'm not sure what word he, the Sanskrit word for ethics is. It may be Dharma, but uh, we'll come to that later. So can I move on a little bit here because, or do you want to, because we're discussing moral issues and yeah, moral yeah. turpitude. And I, I want to come to that late, later, if I can. I'm just a little sure, concerned sure. for time. Make a note of any questions and perhaps come back to it. The second category is ethical issues. By ethical yeah. issues, I refer to those issues where we're not sure what right or wrong is. With the moral issues, we know there's a shortfall. Yeah. Oh, okay. we're falling. But with, but with ethical issues, so as, as I'm using the term, so I, I didn't realize yeah. we are differentiating the analysis also. So when you're talking about moral issues, then your point is that uh, that the process of bhakti will work, but uh, but whether it is working or not, we have to be introspective about that. So we have to look yes. at these values and see, okay, in these cases, it's clear that these are the values I want to develop, but yes. am I developing it or not? So Absolutely. say, for example, with respect to, with respect to the family, say humility, tolerance, that, that can help in preventing the breakup of the family. So um, that Absolutely. was the issue which you mentioned. So am I doing it or not? So yes. the, the direction is clear and the expectation is that by our practice of bhakti, we will be moving in that direction. But what we require is introspection to see, to check whether we are moving in that direction or not. And now you are going to the issues where, where the direction itself may not be clear. Yes, exactly. So introspection may be, of course, part of the process of bhakti. Let's, let's look at that. It may, it may not be separate from bhakti. And Srila Prabhupada suggests that reflecting on those values, which are in a sense moral values, depending on how, particularly if you adopt the approach of virtue ethics, 
but he's saying they're important for spiritual development. Hmm. Not just moral development. See, he's, so the the virtues which are which for some philosophers are, are are central to their moral philosophy, and there's not all philosophers. Uh, in, in in recent times, the, the, the you know the word virtue is kind of almost incomprehensible or unintelligible to some pe people these days. They're not quite sure what you're talking about. We probably need to un unpack the terms value yeah, I think and virtue. The word values is much more common in today's world than virtues. Yes, virtues, well, I think yeah. there's a difference. And I, 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 yeah. got, I don't think we have time to get into the difference, but I think there's a very interesting difference generally bet between the word. And, and there are different opinions, obviously, and different meanings. But again, there is a kind of, there's, a, there's an indication of a kind of evolution in our moral development uh, inherent in the words value and virtue, but I'll come to that later. Okay. But uh, okay. again, um, I think we need to be careful in ISKCON about differentiating between cause and effect. The cause of our moral development, the cause of our knowledge, the cause of our detachment um, is bhakti. But the results must also be there if, if our bhakti is mature. If we're mature, we will have piety. If we're mature, we will have jnana. If we're if we're mature, we will have vairagya. Okay. I, I I'm sorry, I've forgotten the verse, but there is a verse that says that actually those will come automatically. They're the main. Yeah, servants. Vasudeva Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Prayojita Janetya Ashu Vairagyam Jnanam Chayda Hetukam. Yeah, one two seven. Yes, Bhagavatam. Precisely. Yeah. But we we must be very careful not to because bhakti is the cause. We shouldn't think therefore. Um, we can avoid the development of jnana, I'd, I'd say even mundane piety, jnana, knowledge, and detachment. We can't ignore them, but they come automatically. So if we are decrying those features of life... Um, <laughs> oh, so when you are seeing cause and effect... What that bhakti will lead to this, so that doesn't yes. mean that these are unimportant, just because they will come by bhakti. So they are yes, the absolutely. point is they are important, and the glory of bhakti is such that bhakti will lead even to them. But that doesn't yes. mean that they are important. And we can, if we decry or neglect them, then that is that is yeah, definitely that is definitely not not the right thing to do. Absolutely, and especially if we don't have them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. That becomes like sour grapes then. I don't have... sour grapes, but yeah, but possibly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and we're we're all prone to uh, the sour grapes phenomenon. I know. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And I'll come to that later. That you know the, what I call the tension between the the uh, the romantic and the cynic. But uh, let's let's leave that now. Um, but I, I don't think we can avoid the need to develop virtues whether we consider it part of morality or part of spiritual life, we cannot avoid developing the virtues. So there, there are the moral issues. There are, those issue, there are those challenges we have where we fall short, quite understandably, from our own standards individually and uh, collectively. Then there are the ethical issues which are coming up, whether it's ethical to have women gurus, whether it's ethical to drink milk that is derived from commercially or commercially produced milk which mm. is linked to 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 violence uh, himsa to violence um so there's uh, yeah, even even whether it's sometimes right to uh to wear non-devotional clothes <laughs> or devotional clothes there have been some protracted discussions which i mm. think are a little pedestrian and overworked personally uh, and we need to we need we need to address of course, some of those issues as well, particularly the underlying issues regarding, you know, Western dress, Eastern dress, um, uh, India or the West, um, uh, and the, the tendency, if we're not careful, as I mentioned in the last talk, to start to attribute moral status according to material designation. Moral mm -hmm. status according to material designation. Yes. Oh, that means that this, 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 somebody this wearing Indian dress, that means they are morally superior. 
or yeah. somebody is in a particular ashram that means they are morally superior or someone is in a particular religion they are morally superior or someone is a migrant in the country rather than one of the indigenous population and the tendency, what i've noticed is the tendency to define the english culture um according as i would perhaps according to shakespeare but someone told me the other day i thought english culture was fish and chips really oh god and and, and that that is part part of british culture as well in other words we tend to look at our own culture we we judge our own culture according to its highest expression and we often judge other people's cultures according to the lowest expression so how is this considered the highest in english culture is oh, well shakespeare is pretty high i mean he has great insight into people's into human nature i mean you can differ in your view but no 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 uh, i'm not differing in that so so you're saying that okay equating all of english culture with him that's what okay no, what the, the point i'm trying to make and i'm probably not expressing it um clearly enough is we what often the, judge what the phrase you use that we, we, we judge what are the we judge our own use? culture we judge our own culture by the highest aspects no no i got that english own... culture is what did you say english culture is english culture know. is fish and something like that you said something fish and chips what? you know we eat, it's a diet that's quite common it's a meal that's quite common here. okay but what does that got to do with shakespeare well the person the per- person i spoke to who was not of Eng- british origin Hmm. he he was from europe somewhere as far as i remember said that he thought british culture was fish and chips so are you saying that he is demeaning it or he is elevating it what what is are you just reducing well, it to I, one particular thing well, well it 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 it's more it's more it's probably a little more banal fish and chips i don't want to particularly decry fish and chips i mean we're okay. vegetarian we don't eat fish but it, it, it's 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 probably a little more banal Oh, okay. a banal expression because in any any of course this is very sensitive today because in in most cultures you have a high culture and a low culture this is something which is not very popular and people are trying to stop that they don't like any um hierarchy whatsoever but actually in most countries you will find and and in in cultures and ethnicities you will find i would suggest expressions of higher and lower culture um that is true that, that that's very sensitive when discussing uh in the in the contemporary context and according to the current moral environment you know yeah as so we discuss we, so we need to be careful I'm getting, i'm getting clearly what you're saying that so in india also india is a very diverse country and in certain certain communities or certain states it's thought that people of this place are stingy these people are down or these people are very uh, self centered yeah. so that is also like equating lack of moral virtue or moral status with a particular geographical designation or geographical location yeah 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 so i mean, I, mean I, I, yeah. i i'm hor- i'm horrified sometimes by the kind of um articles i've read from some devotees about how a person became interested in krishna consciousness and they were a muslim and therefore how great their conversion is uh that shows um despite um their perhaps noble attentions to 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 praise krishna consciousness but it may show a rather demeaning attitude to, towards a person just because they they follow a particular religion in this case islam so such what so we've got to be very very careful about how we judge other cultures it's a big subject this um yeah, that's a, i don't think i'm going to think how you're putting it this way you know i wouldn't necessarily so if i would if i if i encourage some devotees from a muslim background to write an article about how to came to krishna consciousness you know i would definitely encourage them to write it but it is a remarkable human interest story it it does not necessarily have to reflect that we we consider the particular particular religion to be to be any in more it's not a statement about the moral moral status of any religion or people of this religion but i understand that it could be seen that way given the so 
Yeah, I understand. You know, recently I wrote an article. Well, no, 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 not necessarily seen that. In one or two instances, I, I think perhaps the, the the view of the writer or the speaker is that as well, which is which I find unsettling. I may be judging yeah. wrong. Okay, okay, no, no, I, I understand wrong. what you're saying. That's, that's, that's okay, but we need to be very. What I'm saying is, we need to be very, very careful about judging other cultures. And and there's whole issues about moral relativism and cultural relativism here, and they're very important discussions to have. Because these, uh, the tendency to designate according to designation, to ascribe a person a moral state, to evaluate their moral status by some designation is wrong Mm -hmm. by both current popular, even moral sensibilities, it is wrong. And by our own tradition, it is wrong because Lord Krishna answers Arjuna's moral dilemma by expressing the metaphysical truth. And there's an ethical dimension there to it, um, that we're not this body. Therefore, as soon as we lose that understanding, which of course, for which ISKCON is well known, it's almost our slogan, many, you know, yeah. Uh, you know, we're not this body. So, um, and, 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 and academics and others have noted how, how we use that phrase. But it is the core. It is the beginning only of Lord Krishna's instructions. And therefore, if one actually somehow or other ignores that, then one is immediately not on the platform of morality or to speak of spirituality. One is on the platform of ignorance. There is a challenge here, just quickly, and that is um, that, according to some writers, McIntyre is one person who particularly makes this point, can you divorce any system of ethics from its particularities in terms of a particular people, culture, ethnicity, religion? Can you have what I call a kind of disembodied culture? Um, what do we mean by a spiritual culture that is non-sectarian or transcends everything? And yet, there you are. Here am I with Tosi Mala, which I bought in India. Hmm. <laughs> uh, so some uh, and some writers. I was reading something just a couple of days ago. Um, there was this author. There's a very good book called Branding Bhakti. Yeah, I read that book. It's a remarkably comprehensive, informative, and informative overview of what is happening. Very, very good book by a Greek scholar called Nicole Karapanagiotis. My wife is Greek. She will hate the way I pronounce that. (laughs) But a very good book because she actually not only looks at what is called the Hinduization of ISKCON and the tendency to sometimes perhaps over-identify ISKCON with a particular geographical region or ethnicity, but she also criticizes sometimes the strident voice of universalism, which criticizes Hinduism and any identification of ISKCON and its teachings with India. So, uh, by the way, that this, this, there's a moral, there is a moral discussion about, um, just briefly, particularities and universal truths, um, which is very complex uh, and, and very relevant, but I don't want to get into it now. But these, but what, what I'm saying is, if you're actually on the level of morality that ascribes moral status or spiritual status or whatever, according to designation, you are immediately falling foul of Lord Krishna's teachings. And not just, not the conclusion of his teachings, but the beginning of his teachings. So therefore, this early instruction, and we're applying hermeneutics here because in, in the Vedic notion of hermeneutics, whatever statements are made early on or at the end um, tend to have more importance than those in the middle right here. Um, mm. So <laughs> immediately, I mean, you know, verses 212, 211, 212, 213, 214, 215, yeah, and then the metaphysical basis in two sixteen, and, and and you know very important verses which bring together scripture and our own human condition, 
our own experience. You, me, these soldiers, Krishna's adopting a pedagogical strategy that relates scripture to our own experience. Very important. But he also brings together the connection between moksha, liberation, and dharma, particularly in verse 214. I won't get into it now, but <laughs> hmm. my conclusion is if we're based, I mean, there's different ways to look at morality, whether it be rules or reason or virtues and, or, or some of the theories we have associated with them, such as utilitarianism, rule utilitarianism, or act utilitarianism, Kant's deontology, the Greek virtue ethics and the moral uh, and, and the, the more recent interest uh, the new versions of virtue ethics, which which, which are emerging today, um, very significantly, um, you know, if we if we if we're doing it on that basis of designation, we really are at a low level. Yes. It's not we're, we're, we're not. This there are difficult one question. There. Let's leave one yeah. question, Prabhu. Uh, if we see this sort of equating or assigning certain moral qualities or more specifically moral deficiencies to certain say geographical or regional or cultural demographic that seems to be a universal human tendency for a large part of human history hmm? so that it has been increasingly recognized and critiqued in recent times does that seem to indicate some kind of moral awakening or a sharpening of a moral sensibility because say many even many jokes or say satirical humor or comedy, which was quite, which would have been quite acceptable 20 years ago, it is, it is seen as very inappropriate now. So is it a mo the moral sense is heightening or what, what is exactly happening? I think, I think that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, become, because some would see us human beings generally, if you look at the issue globally as our morality being rather regressive. Others would see it as actually being progressive. Um, I suspect it's probably be a mixture of both. And it is useful to see where we've progressed, but also to look at some of the uh, regressive tendencies in human society and uh, not only our morality, but the nature of our mor moral discourse at the moment, which is highly polarized as, as many, many of us, um, whether we're academics or, or, or whatever, we recognize just by knowing something of, of the news, for example. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I think that's an important question. I think it's very difficult to answer um, for various reasons. There's, 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 there's so many variables involved, um, <laughs> including our own getting older. Um, the, so, the, so it's difficult to, to, to actually come... To, to yeah, I, appreciate your, your, I appreciate the nuance sometimes you bring into the discuss, discussions. So this one thing is true that what you said, that even if the height, there's a heightened moral sensibility, but then along with that, there is also, you could say, almost a heightened moral wrath that there is for political correctness can go towards, uh, towards extremes, severe extremes. So... Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah. don't be non-judgmental and I will be supremely judgmental if you are not non-judgmental. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, this is the long-standing and um, quite broadly discussed, but perhaps not discussed enough, um, contra contradiction in being a liberal. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's inherent. And how do you get around that? And every society makes some kind of moral judgment um, particularly when it comes to the arena of law. I mean, there, there are one or two theorists would say that the law has nothing to do with morality, but I think um, more traditionally, the insight is there, and I, would, I definitely would share that, is that the law should be based on our moral philosophy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Philosophy may be, have a good, a, a pragmatic side to it. I'm, I'm, I don't doubt that. Um, but every society has to know who to exclude in one way or another. And I think that's important to recognize. So 
Yeah, we're raising a few difficult questions here. And those difficult questions will also have to be asked with regard to ISKCON and whether we are criticizing Westerners or whether we're criticizing Indians and Hindus uh, or, or members of other nations. There are some difficult challenges. And please don't tell me that those challenges are not there in ISKCON. They are. And, and we need, need to deal with them. They're difficult ones, yeah. um, and they need to be dealt with sensitively, but they're there. And if per, personally, I think if we go down that route of, you know, not recognizing that uh, we are to some degree ascertaining moral status according to designation, I think we'll be in trouble. But equally, we need to define how our culture is connected to some of its um, roots. Uh, geographical roots, for example, how it's connected to India. I have a particular stance on that, um, which I'll just briefly mention, and that is, um, well, I think a couple of points. One is that Lord Krishna chose to appear there, um, and I think Queen Kunti makes this kind of illusion. You're known as a... By the way, Queen Kunti was really, in, in her prayers, was looking at how the Lord embodies contradictions. <laughs> There's a kind of, you could say she's adopting a highly philosophical dialect, dialectical approach there, um, looking at apparent paradoxes. Um, you're, you know, you're the supreme, you're the unborn, but you were born <laughs> to you, Shoda. <laughs> okay. And then she says, um, you're known as a Yadava, but, and the example is given just like, explains, just like, um, sandalwood Appears grows everywhere. everywhere or in many places, but the best sandalwood comes from the, the, the Malayan hills. Therefore, you, you talk about Malayan sandalwood. Mm. He gives that example. So Lord Krishna appeared in India. So that should be perhaps the only cause for pride, but pride also brings responsibility. As Lord Chaitanya said, if you're born in Bharatvash, Okay. then it brings responsibility. Uh, so if we think we are somehow privileged, as we may be by being born in India, I, I, I don't necessarily question that. But that privilege, bring, of course, privilege is very much decried these days. And I think we've got that wrong. Um, I think we should decry misuse of privilege. I don't think we should condemn privilege itself. Um, and, and, and we see that, you know, that, this is also on designation these days. So you're a white heterosexual. <laughs> Therefore, your moral status is somehow suspicious. Um, uh, or or you're, you're somehow inheriting the sins of your forefathers. Anyway, there's a whole discussion there. But um, yeah, these are some of the discussions. And they're not easy ones to have because both rooting our morality in a specific tradition in a parochial or narrow or selfish sense based on our bodily designations is wrong. But there's also some difficulties in thinking that actually um, the particularities of our tradition, the connection to India, for example, or its roots in a particular sampradaya is entirely meaningless. Uh, and I think we need to negotiate that. By the way, um, I don't think I've got a lot of answers for that. Um, I've suggested some things, some ideas regarding the need to um, say that Krishna could have chosen anywhere, but he chose India. And therefore, by Krishna's presence and the presence of Krishna consciousness, um, India is important. And also to suggest that that should bring humility um, rather than um, a more ostentatious form of pride. And that goes for all of us, by the way, whatever whatever tradition we're born in, we're born in. But those, those are long questions. But anyway, we've discussed here um, some of the moral issues that we have. We've discussed some of the ethical issues where we're unsure about what's right or wrong, um, such as, you know, uh, as pertain to, to a, a hinks of milk, for example. Um, and, and the third one is um, how the ethical environment, as it is now, tends to evoke 
perhaps more negative responses to some of Srila Prabhupada's statements in his books than they did in the 1960s, when some of the questions about identity politics and uh, sexual diversity, when those questions were being placed on the table, um, whereas nowadays many um, thinkers and social commentators uh, and social activists would say that those questions are answered. And, and I'd, I'd like to answer, make one point here. It would be useful if we recognize that many of us, despite our diverse backgrounds, ask similar questions, despite the fact we may give different answers. Of course, there will be diversity in the question. We shouldn't think we ask all ask the same questions. I think that's a mistake also. But I will make the proposal that if we look at the questions, there will be more commonality than if we look at the answers. And we need to appreciate, and my, my study in Western philosophy has been quite exciting because I see that they ask the same questions that we ask. Interesting. For example, same questions. Huh? No, in what the same, same moral, questions? The same moral questions, for example, um, and sometimes they provide similar answers. For example, you know, the question, and it's one of the six questions in the Bhagavatam, where does morality now reside now that Krishna has returned to his own abode, accompanied by religion, knowledge, and so on? Do you know that question? It's one of the six main questions. Yes. Krishna is Dharma Pagate. That when Krishna departs, what is going to, where is he, where has Dharma gone to reside now? Yes. Yes. Well what, well, what about the conversation in the West about the death of God, which was which was brought up by Kierkegaard and Nietzsche and others? Um, and it wasn't saying that God is literally dead. The concern more was, now that we've given up religion, or we're trying to give up religion as the source of our moral truths, hmm. where are we going to anchor them reliably? Well, this is so insightful. I, I read about Nietzsche's statement about death of God, and I never correlated it with Bhagavatam. It's amazing. But see the similarity to the questions. I mean, obviously, they're somewhat different. Oh, yeah, um, but that's a huge amount but, of similarity still. Yeah, so, yeah. So in the fact, human condition. The, in fact, the, Nietzsche, when he, in his passage also, he talks about the social catastrophe resulting from the death of God. And not just social yeah. catastrophe, he says that, you know, the, all the oceans will not be enough to cleanse the hands from this greatest sin of sins that we have committed. So he's talking about uh, apocalyptic proportions of problems. And the departure of Krishna and the advent of Kaliuga is also at least a moral like, apocalypse that uh, the Bhagavatam talks about. So it's very similar. Yeah. Um, I think I think I think we need to be careful about attributing the loss of morality only to the, as it were, the the metaphorical death of God or or to the decline in religion. Um, I think we need to be careful about that personally, um, uh, because for various reasons. Uh, one being that we may not define in our own tradition religion in the same way as most people do or specific, more specifically, as it's defined by the Abrahamic traditions. Um, I think we need to be careful of that. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've even raised that question, as I mentioned last time, whether the word dharma, which some writers have said is almost, some have said it's equivalent, some say almost equivalent to the word ethics, dharma. Um, and, and that's debatable. It's a very interesting debate. But the question is, is it more accurately translated as religion or is it more accurately translated as ethics? And I'm suggesting that we need to actually be very, very careful about identifying ISKCON as a religion um, in the sense that's particularly in the sense that's commonly understood. And it, it might be better to identify it as an ethics or, uh, or having an ethical, an ethical culture, if you like, with an ethical philosophy that ultimately, or ma many aspects of that broad Vedic culture, point towards two things. One is the need for an absolute, 
in order to actually make any kind of decisions. Although that absolute begins with the self, not with God, not with Ishvara. And I think that's significant. I think we have to be very, we have to note the significance of that. <clears throat> and secondly, that that absolute is ultimately personal. Now, there's some very interesting discussions in, in Western philosophy, <clears throat> and I'm particularly thinking of the discussions about relational ethics, caring ethics, which in, in which many uh, lady philosophers were prominent, women philosophers. Um, but I think actually, I detect that actually and, and some of those caring ethics and relational ethics, sometimes they're categorized as virtue ethics or virtue ethicists is in that category. And the idea there is that actually our virtues are not something that just belong to us individually, but they're something that are nurtured within and expressed within loving relationships. So you've got the, the, the ideas of reciprocity. Yeah, give and take. Now, if you start to think about Russia theology, you can start to remarkable, see okay. remarkable similarities. So we, reckon, we, we at least can recognize that philosophers, are, you know, they have some insight. They're at least beginning to ask the right questions. Sometimes the questions may be wrong. Sometimes there may be a construction of an elaborate philosophy, which is more or less an attempt to avoid um, morality in its true sense. I think that has to be, you know, it, it, it's a self, it's self deluding or self uh, Iris Murdoch, one Irish British philosopher talked about the, the way we use morality and moral philosophy for self consolation instead of seeing the stark reality of life. And, and for that reason, uh, I think her favorite play uh, by Shakespeare was King Lear, which, by the way, is, 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 is brut it, 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 it's brutally exposing about the realities of life and death and brutally exposing about some of our notions of love um, as King Lear, as expressed by the three daughters of King Lear for the king. <laughs> yeah, they just tell, they just and, 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 and how Cordelia epitomized true love, even though King Leah um, didn't like her response. Anyway, there's, there's, a, there's a whole issue there. But, but you know, some of these philosophers are asking the right questions. Can we give, and I think we can, potentially at least, give tenable answers? useful answers for these some of these moral questions and can we address some of the practical issues that the world is facing and can we do that with authenticity and with insight mm. with realization which which is by the way what carries forward our parampara our parampara is not carried by literal truth it is carried by full assimilation of knowledge, which we call realization. That's interesting. Prabhupada says it, specifically that it is not carried by literal truth. It is not carried by literal truth. Prachila Prabhupada says he, he refers to the, the Karma Kanda tradition, Karma okay, Yoga, that is what he's saying as, literal truth, as okay. being inclined towards that literal interpretation uh, and very rules based. And you can't go beyond the rules. If you, when you're doing the yajna, you have to pronounce the right syllables. You can't make a mistake. Mm. Otherwise, you get the wrong result, as expressed by certain stories of Indra and Vritasura and so on. That's interesting. When you're using the word literal truth, you're using it more in terms of, say, like a ritual literalist, in terms of literalist, in terms of rituals. No. Uh, you know, absolutely. I, th I think we need to be very careful about that literal truth because, um, yeah, it, it's difficult because there is something which is called metaphorical truth. And I know you don't want, we don't sometimes want to jump into assuming there's a, a metaphor or allegorical story when there isn't one. I think we need to be very careful of that. But um, 
the kind of more the approach to truth and factual knowledge as expressed through uh, philosophies such as logical positivism. Um, and of course, um, our late devotee, His Holiness um, Bhakti Damodar Swami spoke to Srila Prabhupada about logical, we had a conversation about logical positivism. Um, yeah, they don't sit well with us. There is a kind of metaphorical and using the term positively mythical approach to truth in our tradition. By the word, here's a need for here's another need for hermeneutics. For some, it, the word <coughs> myth has now taken on a new meaning. For example, if I say Chitanya Chandra told me we would be talking at at ten o'clock, but that was a myth. <laughs> in other words it's almost it's almost been synonymous with lie <laughs> by the way I, it, was a, it was it was a mistake with you sorry um and i'm saying it's almost, six myths about this thing six myths about india or five myths yeah, yeah, about yeah. Uh, so and so that that yeah so myths is equated with falsehood but myth has a much different connotation in absolutely yeah absolutely and and and, and you know we we cannot think without metaphor I mean, even you think about modern science, and uh, what about the whole narrative of the dinosaurs and, and, and Darwin's narrative of evolution? It is a narrative. Mm. We inherit. You know, Prabhu, this is a big subject, and maybe we should have a separate podcast on this metaphorical and mythical dimensions in Krishna consciousness. It's Bhaktivinoda Thakur talks a lot about this in Chaitan Shiksha Amrut and Krishna Samhita. And somehow we have overlooked it quite a bit. So, it, yeah, I mean, it does raise the question of the relationship between fact and value, the relationship between ontology and ethics. Yeah. But my, but my, one of my suggestions is that even though, um, unlike Hume and, and, and some modern philosophers, uh, the non naturalists, they're called. Um, I think there's a strong connection between one's cogni cognition and one's values. Um, how we actually understand and articulate that connection between our ontological beliefs and our metaphysics and the ethical dimensions of life is a big question. And I think in our own tradition, they're much, our own Vaishnav tradition, they're much more holistic. However, I will say, I do think that many ISKCON devotees have given too much attention to the metaphysical discussion without understanding the ethical strands of thought or the ethical issues that are inherent within those. The Bhagavad Gita is a moral text in many ways. True. So the question is, how do the ontological truths such as the self, and we may have time to discuss them. We may have to do it in the future uh, in another podcast. How do, how do those relate? Uh, the idea that we're not this body, there is an eternal self. Um, how does that relate to our ethics? But the danger is that we don't, we ignore the ethical dimensions and think that Krishna consciousness is all about a set of philosophical truths often more framed as beliefs, which kind of infers a less reflective approach. Um, I, I think we need to be, I think we need to be careful of that. And we need to give more attention to the, not only the ethical challenges we have, but how, whether or not we are sufficiently discussing ethics or more or less assuming we know about it, decrying mundane morality, or sweeping this discussion under the mat. Mm, beautiful. And I'd suggest we have to give attention, and particularly those who are administrators must, according to the Bhagavatam at least, give attention to the, to the moral ethos of their domain as... There are many examples, such as Maharaj Purikshit, for example. Um, those examples are there, 
and therefore the reductionism that comes when we suggest that the chanting of Hare Krishna is the only solution needs to be looked at. It needs to be examined. There's truth there. Here's another, here's another challenge. I, 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 I think it's an opportunity to express it. Just one minute, bro, if you don't mind. I just, oh, I just think a lot, two, two, three things came in my mind before you move ahead in this. That uh, this whole, you mentioned uh, that we emphasize the ontology a lot, that we emphasize the philosophy, as you said, but uh, how that philosophy is to be translated into action. That is not so, that is, that is, we don't have so much guidance. It's more like black and white, do this, don't do this. But what about nuances? So in some ways, could we place this in terms of, you know, there is, there is emphasis on Sambandha Gyan, but Abhideya in terms of how we are going to fix the mind on Krishna in this situation. So that, there is not sufficient uh, education about that, not sufficient direction about that. So, I mean, that's a whole different dimension and maybe we could discuss it separately. But uh, could could the translation of say, could Sambandha broadly be ontology and uh, Abhideya be a part of ethics? This is this is the very important question you ask. Extremely important, and and, and I, I tend to agree with you. Um, I wouldn't say that ontology is not important, but certainly if we're only at that, I'm, I'm thinking a little more pedagogically. And but and it's interesting that when you come to the particular approach, which was quite prevalent in many pre-modern societies, including the Greek, and I would probably say ours as well, and that's virtue ethics. Um, the kind of theories that surrounding virtue ethics are very closely linked. Minute. Can you explain what you mean by virtue ethics? Because you use that term repeatedly. In one sense, isn't ethics about virtue itself? So it seems tautological to some extent. What does it? Um, well, the, deba the, de the debates are often very fractured and, and sometimes they're very poor, I think, because um, they sometimes try to emphasize one aspect of moral um, sense or sensibility uh, or, or different ways of improving our moral status individually and societally. Um, and sometimes those approaches become fractured. And there's in, in recent academic discourse and in, in Western academic space, there is definitely a move to more holistic ideas um, of recognizing that we shouldn't just have these different philosophies which emphasize rules or reason or utilitarianism and the consequences of what we do, or indeed the values, but we need to come up with a more syncretic model that synthesizes these. And I, and I, I fully agree with that. But you could say that actually one model may give more attention to consequences, and that is consequentialism. We should think about the results of what we're doing. That mm -hmm. stands quite strongly in contrast to Kant's deontology, just stick to the principles. The, the rules have principles behind them. We have to stick to those principles, mm. whatever the whatever the context. Uh, most people think he, got, he was a little extreme there, and I tend to agree. Um, and then others will say that it is virtues that really, to different degrees, are prominent and should help inform our reason and our rules. And I, I, I feel very, personally, I feel very, very strongly on that. Now, just going back to what happened with the enlightenment here in Europe, when the revolutionaries in France uh, tried to establish reason, they even built with often within the existing churches and cathedrals, shrines dedicated to reason. Yeah, I read about that. God is uh, they reason. Worship, yeah, in, I think it was 1793, was it? They, in uh, Notre Dame, they had this whole, the whole altar was set up with a mountain. And on that mountain, which probably represented Olympus, I'm not sure, were busts of the different philosophers. And then there was a opera singer dressed as, 
um, the goddess Liberty, dressed in red, white, and blue. Um, and there was this whole worship of reason. Uh, and reason has been lifted, particularly through, in, in ethics, analytic philosopher, the analytic philosophers, particularly Russell, Wittgenstein, uh, and others. Um, reason was going to guide us. Now that God has gone, let's, let's rely on reason. Mm. Now that the, the clergy have gone, let's rely on our own reason. Now that we've uh, got rid of the kings, or at least just made them into more or less um, symbolic monarchs. Now let us, as the, the people, use reason to de decide what are our moral principles. But my question, by the way, I'm a great supporter of reason. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Don't get me wrong at all. However, my question is this. Have people become more rational, more reasonable, in their moral debate. I obviously think that in many ways they haven't. And the question is, why not? Can That's reason alone? Point point, Prabhu. In one sense, some of the dialogue about uh, political correctness, there is a significant dismissal of reason also that Feelings are uh, given far more priority than facts or reasonable discussion based on facts. So that uh, there are two things. And then you can say, is reason worthy of becoming God? And whether we are actually becoming reasonable? So both questions are important. Yeah, and there's, there's, there's a huge leaning towards the idea, despite some support for personal autonomy, and I, I'm also a great believer in personal autonomy, but I'm also a great believer in the uh, the, the respect that is given to elders. Uh, 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 also, and uh, I don't see I, I don't see necessarily a a, a fragmenting tension. Let's put I, I, between our own individual choice, our own free will, and that that need to defer to some kind of authority. Um, I, I, I don't see that as a problem. Um, but yeah, these days, uh, there are many who say that actually not only we've dismissed reason and actually in the name of personal autonomy and, and I guess our own personal sense of reason, we've slipped in towards what is called emotivism. Emotivism, yeah, that's true, true. Yeah, emotivism. And, and, and McIntyre, that was his critique. And actually now it, it seems that actually uh, there's very much the idea amongst many social activists that the world has to conform to our wishes. But, yeah. you know, a mature person understands that while trying to improve society, for example, mm -hmm. we have a responsibility to adjust ourselves to the realities of the world. I think in America, the coddling of the American mind and who's that Jonathan Haidt? He talks a lot about Haidt, this yes. microaggressions and how these are actually making, making, they're meant to make people safe, but they're actually making people weak. So they're making people more yes. fragile. Students are becoming more fragile and that's so true. So Prabhu, I'm just, I mean, you covered a lot of territory. So when, my question was about virtue ethics. So what you're saying is that there are different uh, different ideas of ethics. So some is that like just rule bound, some is consequence bound, some is, uh, some are, we could say like emo emotion, emotion centered. So virtue ethics is one kind of ethics where the, where the focus is on developing and expressing virtues in our actions. That, so consequences and emotions and uh, rules are important, but they are, subordinated to the to the virtues is that what you mean by virtue ethics yeah i mean there are there are, there are different um philosophers and, and philosophies um often a little too fragmented um i was just reading an article by someone called timothy chapel who, who makes this point and very often certain questions are associated with the various approaches 
So the, the consequentialist approach, we would ask the question, what are the results of that action going to be? And particularly with utilitarianism, will it bring the maximum happiness for the maximum number of people? Hmm. And then with, with, with Kantian deontology, we say, yeah, but what is the principle behind that? What is the universal principle behind that that, we have, that we're compelled to follow, all of us, irrespective of where we're born or whatever, or of the context? And then the question is for virtue ethicists, as, as is often placed, is um, what would a virtuous person do under these circumstances? So it's often associated with role models. We can ask, what would my spiritual master do under these circumstances? Um, and certainly all of us use this. When I was, I'm studying now at Cambridge University, and I was actually thinking maybe I should be a little, go somewhere a little less expensive, um, somewhere like, Birmingham or somewhere else. Uh, my own inclination, um, largely because perhaps my sense of false ego was to go for Oxford or Cambridge. Um, but then I asked the question, what would Srila Prabhupada want? And just knowing him, he would probably say, go for the best. That's my reading of Srila Prabhupada. And that, that's open to interpretation. And others will disagree with me, I'm sure. But uh, but it's it's a kind of natural process, and many of these theories, um, or these sensibilities, if you like, that we've built into elaborate theories, are, are natural to us. We ask them at certain times. But I think that question, or all those three questions, are too limiting, and 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 Timothy Chapel make, makes that makes those points. I think there are more questions we've got to ask about values and virtues. What does this virtue mean? Um, what conduct is expressed through that virtue? Can there be um, a kind of semblance of that virtue, such as false humility rather than real humility? And what does it look like? Or what do both of them look like? Um, how do we actually develop the virtues? Uh, certainly, the kind of repeated appeal as I could make to you, Chaitanya Charan, you've got to be humble. Prabhu, be humble. <laughs> okay. Those repeated appeals, um, even if made with more humility than I, <laughs> I made the appeal, may not really represent a, a, a real comprehensive strategy towards developing the virtues. Yeah. In, in fact, in, my, in fact, it's, it's probably only the beginning. So to actually keep reiterating certain truths through slogans, such as books of the basis, I'm not sure how much that's going to be useful in itself. I must say, that's my critique of. I mean, I think it's useful for us, perhaps, to emphasize the centrality of the teachings we're receiving through Srila Prabhupada and indeed the whole parampara. I think I think that's important. Yeah. But you know how we frame that and more importantly the question how do we become Krishna conscious and how do we develop all the virtues through that process? I, I, I think a, a very, very important because Krishna consciousness is intimately linked, I suggest, to the virtues. Our self-realization doesn't mean we become at any point transcendental to the virtues. I don't see that. We may be transcendental to mundane morality. That's fine, I accept that. But whether we can actually completely separate, and if you try to define what is Krishna consciousness that actually makes it far greater than morality, I suggest it's hard to find an answer to that question without some resort to virtue, albeit a Krishna conscious virtue such as prema, love of God. Mm. But I'm going off. I'm going off the point here, and I think we should come back to our discussion actually. Yeah, no, because I think I, 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 I think we need to. I think we need to actually ask at some point. We may not have time now. How much time do you have for you? No, I'm okay. Usually, our podcasts go for about a couple of hours. We can go a little more also. Or we could discuss in future. Uh, we could continue this in another discussion. But I think at least some level of uh, rounding up of the discussion should be there. 
So I think one question that comes up is that uh, whether we want to have a separate podcast for this because it's going to take up a, a big point. So once we understand the need for, we could say, addressing a moral and ethical issues, would there be a, can we have a, like a overall moral philosophy and uh, how would we develop that? That would be a question in itself. Because it's one thing to, like like you said, that repeating be humble is not going to make us humble. So remit, similarly repeating, you know, we need to study ethics or we need to become develop ethical behavior. That itself is not, repeating that is not going to make uh, somebody ethical. So there has to be some, both uh, like a, uh, at the level of thought as well as the level of guide action, there has to be some overall philosophy, if I may use that word, isn't it? No, absolutely. I, I, I mean, moral philosophy has sometimes avoided these important issues, the practical issues, um, particularly the beginning of the 20th century in Britain with the emphasis on analytic philosophy in Cambridge. Um, and therefore, people such as um, Bernard Williams saying, Ethics is actually no longer discussing it, the ethical issues. It, it, it's become really heady um, and it is no longer addressing the real issues of the world. And of course, our tradition, while favoring reason and, and nuanced thought uh, and the need for the, uh, the Muni, particularly the Stitta di Muni, um, then, you know. We've also, it's also very practical. It's got to help people. It's got to be appropriate to the welfare of the world. Hmm? Mm, true. It must be appropriate to the world's welfare. So it has to be practical. But let me just address this. I, I think there are some reason, reasons we need um, a moral philosophy or at least some kind of broad framework just that enables us to make moral and ethical decisions that go beyond the kind of emotivism that we discussed previously and, and the type of emotivism that, is, that is, is a threat, if you like, to religious communities is um, what I call personal opinion backed by Shastra or backed by scripture. Mm. How do we know we're not just presenting my personal opinion backed by scripture now i think i'll just I'll, I'll add a caveat that i think i'm not a great fan of what i call absolute objectivity um when it comes to moral authority um i think subjective opinions are important particularly when they're enshrined in insight as we mentioned before but the danger is that actually we are merely expressing some of our emotional responses to an issue and looking for verses to substantiate that. I'm guilty of it myself when I, I try to favor education. So I'm always looking for verses on education. Uh, and perhaps I reject those uh, verses that, that say that logic is insufficient for um, spiritual life and indeed morality, I would say. So I think we, 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 the tendency is there in all of us so I think we need a theory to which we're accountable, right? We're accountable to our philosophy. Now, haven't we got it in our, our theology? Yes, we have, but we need an autonomous discipline. And for a couple of reasons, I'd say we need an autonomous discipline. First, the Vedic tradition has categorized the various scriptures. It has cap categorized the various um, subject matters that each body of literature discusses. We've got the Vedangas and the, uh, the Dharma Sutras and, and, and so on, the, the epics. I mean, I mean, there's divisions of, and those divisions are explained in terms of certain subjects that they address. Um, hermeneutics is, is also there. Um, so I think it's there in our tradition, but there's one criticism of our tradition that whereas it's, it's codified and very carefully analyzed, 
its epistemology and its metaphysics and so on, it's been a little less um, eager to codify its ethics in terms of a moral philosophy. Whether that by judgment... It, by it, you mean the Indian tradition or we as movement, both? Uh, I'm talking about the broader Indian and Vedic, Indian, Hindu, Vedic traditions. Yeah. They're probably... But, I mean, they have done, um, in a, to some degree, that there's the Dharma Sutras. Yeah. There's the Manu Smriti, uh, other Smritis that are connected with that. Um, personally, I think... Um, Oft, often they're, they're, they're not fully adequate for today's discourse. Um, and I'd, 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 I'd favor the Bhagavad Gita, and I'll, I can come to that probably in the next podcast, because I think the, the Bhagavad Gita very much provides us with a framework for our moral philosophy. Uh, it may not necessarily fill in all the details. It's more of a preliminary text. Um and I, and I think Chaitanya Mahaprabhu fills in some of the details as well. Um, to, to, to questions that are asked in Western philosophy as well as our own. Um, but I think probably that's one area where we haven't quite got that kind of autonomous or semi-autonomous discipline um, that we need. I mean, devotees very often, I think this is admirable, since early on in Iskand's history, they've collected quotes on certain subjects. So you can find quotes on Varn Ashram, you can find relevant quotes on marriage, and a number of subjects uh, through some initiatives like, uh, what is the initiative? It's not Veda base, there's another initiative. Vani by the Vani Kosh. Yeah, the, the, the Vani quotes, yes, very good initiative. Um, I think they're important. However, I will say that a list of quotes, and, and we're drawing a little bit on hermeneutics here, is not, is not really a autonomous, coherent um, theory on, any, on that specific subject. It, we need to take it further. In one sense, I would say that we're taking, look, putting on my educational hat, we're taking a kind of a, a, taking a pedagogical perspective. We're looking at um, and, and, and a practical perspective. We're looking at, at thematic learning. You know, we you know we can start with scripture, and we can come to some conclusions, and we can also that theory can inform our practice of both morality and Krishna consciousness, our lifestyles as devotees. But another way of approaching this pedagogically is we start with a dilemma, an issue, a need, an opportunity, whatever it is. And then we go from that context in which we find ourselves by destiny, perhaps, we then go to scripture to find the relevant quotes. So building on that, if we want to, if we want to, for example, and I think this is an important need related to devotee care, if we want to avoid um, some of the tensions involved with counseling and giving counseling and bringing in useful, sometimes useful insights from non-devotee counselors, we really need our own system of counseling. What is our own th sorry theory, our methodology, our fear and theory of counselling? What is the Krishna conscious way to give counsel to others? If we're going to actually develop useful leadership, we need a theory of leadership based on our own scriptures, but which goes beyond the list of quotes. There is a hermeneutical process of how they all link together and the implications of that. They need to be, they need to embody ultimately personal insight as expressed through our scriptures and as some devotees are also expressing uh, into that particular field of service that some of us have, namely administrative leadership. Or if we're an educator, do we really have our own 
philosophy of education? Do we have, do we know what our pedagogy, do we really know what our pedagogy is besides decrying Western education and their theories? Do we have a good alternative? And by the way, it's there, and I, I think it would be useful to discuss in, 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 if, you, if you wish in another podcast, because I, I see quite a close connection between our um, pedagogical processes and you referred to Sambanda, De Abide, and Priyogena. And I, I think our, that is a very useful framework for hanging the rest of our pedagogical theory on. Mm. We need these. So we need these. And Srila Prabhupada has given some quotes. So the Krishna consciousness movement comprehends all sides of life. It is not a stereotype churchianity weekly going to the church and coming back and doing all, I guess she, there's, there's a dot, 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 but Srila Prabhupada may be saying nonsense there. No, it is embracing all sides of our life. Srila Prabhupada lecture on Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 3, Verse 19, given in Los Angeles on the 5th of June, 1972. And one more quote. Srila Prabhupada also writes, human intellect is developed for advancement of learning in art, science, philosophy, physics, chemistry, psychology, economics, politics, etc. By culture of such knowledge, the human society can attain perfection of life. This perfection of life culminates in the realization of the Supreme Being, Vishnu. From the purport to the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 5, Verse 22. Yeah. This 1522 is a very famous verse for the celebrated quote of Prabhupada. What you're saying. So, but it's interesting the way you are reading it is slightly different. So, so for example, that 1522 is often used by devotees, scientists, or do, that we should use science to establish the existence of God. Uh, but what, you, if I understand you, what you are saying is that, that these branches of knowledge in themselves, if we learn them and if we, ask, we apply them, we excel in them, they can, their perfection is that through them itself, we can realize God. Is that the direction you're taking in these two quotes? Absolutely. We need a Krishna conscious society. We can't, we can't just have what I've called before a disembodied spirituality. I don't think that Srila Prabhupada wanted that. I think Srila Prabhupada wanted us. I think he recognized, and I think if you read very carefully his instructions, he recognized the need to for ISKCON but also the need for ISKCON to have an influence on broader society so that actually all our interactions and all these useful branches of knowledge lead us towards Krishna consciousness. And if we try to present some kind of religious practice, which I would identify with churchianity, Separate from that knowledge, that comprehensive knowledge that Srila Prabhupada has given us, we are making a mistake. And it will not be helpful. It will not help Krishna consciousness go forward as much as it could. It will there will always be some benefit. You know, that's so true. Like if people think of us primarily as, say, those people who dance on the streets, or those are people who hand out books on the streets. It's good that they know us, but if that is what they think about us, then we are not really representing our tradition. If that is all that people think about us. They are, we are not really representing our tradition at all properly. And that's not recognizing the guidelines we've been given by Srila Rupa Goswami in saying that actually the goal of Prema starts with Shraddha. How is that connected? Another well, it's connected by the fact that there's many, well, recently I was having, there was some dispute about whether we're teaching, and then it was a very, not a dispute, it was a good discussion, you know, open-minded discussion about whether we're 
teaching about Krishna consciousness or we're teaching about the environment. Uh, and there was some idea, well, teaching Krishna consciousness directly is better than teaching about the environment. Uh, and my take on that is that the two can be brought together by understanding what our pedagogical, what our educational aims are. If our aim is to build faith, it doesn't really matter whether we're directly teaching people to chant Hare Krishna or we're telling them that we can be relevant to environmental issues. Now, according to Rupa Goswami, one's got to go beyond just initial shraddha, building faith. But still, here is a framework that brings together some of our endeavors. And therefore, if people recognize that ISKCON devotees have something useful to say on the environment, their faith in us will increase. Their trust in us will increase. Oh, okay. And that will help them come to Krishna consciousness. So I don't see that. I don't see that, that idea that this is direct preaching and this is, we use this word bridging preaching, which I think is misleading. Um, in some ways, all our preaching is bridging. It's about me being on one shore of a river, you being on another side of the river, and somehow coming together as two individuals. <laughs> oh, God. Relationships. Relationships. We have to build it. So I, I think we need to reframe some of these discussions because the way some discussions are framed is divisive. And by reframing them, we can see there is more commonality than we previously thought. I don't know whether that makes sense. Oh, no, this is a lot of points. I mean, two points which struck me is that all preaching, preaching is bridging. Yeah, it's just we could say that, okay, this bridge is reaching the, some bridges reach people. We could say that it's, this is a river. At this point, the river is very narrow. And this is a straightforward bridge. But mm. some bridges may need to be very long and complicated to reach people who are far away from the point where we are. But every preaching is bridging. That's remarkable. Yeah, so we, need to, we, need to be, we need to be careful about some of these distinctions. And I think, I think the tension here is between um, those who would like to emphasize the goal and those who would, would like to emphasize the next step. And we tend to find some are probably a little more, lib probably the liberals tend to incline towards emphasizing the next step. Sometimes those who are perhaps, if I could describe them as a little more fundamental, would be more inclined to emphasize the goal. Well, you've got to keep the goal in mind. Um, <laughs> uh, Beautiful. But actually, but, but you know, if we, if we draw a little bit from my own experience, I, I will draw from my own experience in, in Western education, good education means you know the aim and you know the objectives, both. It's not, it's not a question of one or the other. And actually the question for us, for ISKCON, and one devotee was raising this, uh, I think the, the devotee involved in the conversation after our pod, last podcast, very nicely, kind of alluded to this, if not directly, the need to have those pure devotees, those who are really pure. Um, I agree with that. But I think there's a, there's another way of looking at this this challenge is, you know, um, whether we're highly advanced or not so advanced, and there's a case for saying there's always going to be a mixture here, and there's probably going to be more of us who are less advanced than those who are highly advanced. There's always going to be less of us. We're going to be in the popular side. We're not we're not very advanced. But the question isn't, you know, how advanced are we and, and which of these two we should emphasize and, and, and get into those fractured discussions. But do we, wherever we are situated, do we exhibit integrity? I may be a householder and maybe, I, 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 and that's because I'm not advanced. Someone may be a sannyasi and it may be because he is capable of that. 
But Lord Chaitanya seems to suggest in the story, two stories, that relating to Chota Haridas and that relating to Shivananda Sena when his wife gave birth to a child. And Srila Prabhupada says explicitly, I don't have the quote here, but it's a very good one. I can see if I can find it. It says explicitly, it's not a question of whether one is detached or less attached. It is a question of integrity. Lord Chaitanya wasn't bothered. I mean, that, that child that Shivananda Sain's wife had didn't come, it, it wasn't a virgin birth. <laughs> oh, <laughs> to put it bluntly. Beautiful. It wasn't. A, it wasn't. But he embraced him and chose to Haridas because of a little indiscretion. So I thought, so there's some issues here about perhaps my feeling is, and uh, we could question that it is a subjective feeling. Um, and whether I've got insight or deluded here, we, we, we can discuss is that we need to give more attention to integrity. Acting with integrity. Achar this again brings achar. us back to the topic of ethics and authenticity, integrity. So, so integrity, it also, it in one sense, uh, it is also, you talked earlier about this beautiful point that are you focusing on the next step or are you focusing on the goal? So mm -hmm. we could now, if somebody asks uh, that, uh, like we are having, I'm having these podcasts. So how many people became devotees because of this podcast or because of these podcasts in general? Well, it's like you build a temple and then new people come and become devotees. That's, that's, uh, that's wonderful. And yes, we want people to, we want everyone to learn to love Krishna. But then wherever somebody is, if we are helping them take one step forward from where they are, that is also a service. And in fact, uh, you can say that I think in Krishna in 326 says that don't push people to take like too giant a leap. Help them take a step. You know, he says that don't disturb the minds of people who are attached, uh, but encourage them to take a step forward from where they are. So, so overall, I never thought of framing the liberal conservative or that, that kind of debate in terms of the next step or the final goal. And both are required. We can't just uh, have, as you said, the aim and the objectives. Both are there. And there would be some people who would focus more on one thing and some who will focus on other things. So Absolutely. And, and, teach, and teachers, when you write aims and objectives, you go into the lesson knowing your aim, but you also know the objectives, the next step. And you keep both in mind. And, and this false dichotomy between one or the other is useless, worse than useless. It's counterproductive. We need, you always need to keep in, in mind both of them. Why create that argument between those who actually propose one and those who favor the other? It's, it's a false dilemma. It should be avoided as far as possible. I mean, recognize there's a tension there. That's okay. There's, but, but use that tension constructively, you know. So that's why we need theory again. The other thing I'm going to say is you, you asked the question, why do we need to dialogue with a Western moral philosophy? And I've got two reasons for that. One is that much of our outreach is taking place in the Western countries. Uh, not all of it, but, but, but we have to frame it according to what people presently understand, their present knowledge, and build on that. Secondly, those of us who come from a Western background, our inner architecture will always be molded by that background. I'm never going to become Indian in this life as much as I may like to. I'm, I'm, I, I won't change my nature. I'm always going to think in a particular way, which may be somewhat different than the way you think. By the way, I tend to think that philosophers, when they're uh, the philosophers more than those who are less philosophical, will probably be able to see commonality rather than difference. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think so. I think I think so. But um, but I think we're always going to be informed by our upbringing and our cultural background. I don't think we can escape that context um, and we have to deal with it. We have to, as much as we try and 
um, abandon our cultural baggage, or what I'd rather call our, more positively, our cultural capital or our moral capital, Beautiful. we have to somehow en engage with it. And we, we have to start seeing the truths that we've inherited from our many gurus, even our parents. You know, If we're respectful to our parents, we will see they've given us something, including most likely some moral sensibility. There may be some challenges. There will be some shortcomings. But we also have some, some moral capital we bring with us. So I don't I think we have to have that dialogue and show that Krishna consciousness is capable of having that authentic, well-reasoned dialogue on moral issues rather than simply the imposition of, uh, of some kind of rules or um, even possibly pre-digested you know, conclusions. We have to have that dialogue. That debate is there in our own tradition. That culture of constructive debate is there, of conversations and conversations within conversations. <laughs> That's what the Bhagavatam is about. Um, uh, we, ha we have to have. We have to have that. So can we actually win? And and the uh, kind of one of the. Again, that's why we need a moral... For Actually, what I'm doing here is starting to point towards why we need an autonomous moral philosophy so that it actually can be compared to and be in dialogue with the various forms of moral philosophy we have at the moment in the Western world. We need to be able to do that. Because if we're going to... I mean, whether we like it or not, much of the moral conversation is still dominated by Western thought. Okay, we're objecting to that. There are issues of colonialism and imperialism, but still that conversation is prevalent and we need to perhaps enter into that conversation with some humility rather than just barge into it. That doesn't mean we're acquiescent. We're gonna say, no, you've got that wrong. But we have to be able, to, as, well as, as well as showing you've got that wrong, we have to be able to provide some uh, and I think there's one philosopher, um, what's his name? Billy Moria, Purushottam Billy, Billy Moria. He writes extensively on Hindu ethics uh, and Indian ethics. He says that, you know, that Western philosophers are now open to new insights from other traditions. So can we actually provide some new insights? And I think there are some very interesting concepts, whether they're, meta-ethical concepts or ontological concepts that we can bring to play. And I think the tree guna is one of them. And I'm going to suggest as time is moving on that perhaps next podcast, if, if you're amenable to that, of course, uh, we deal with some of the, you know, some of the, some of the concepts that we have that could, could form the basis of a moral philosophy, give us some broad structure at least. Yes, that would be wonderful. I think, uh... We, we sometimes we may say that uh, say sometimes devotees make the grandiose claim that that the Vedic scriptures have answers to all questions, and uh, you know in okay that's it's good as a statement but okay this is the question I have what is the answer that you have for this we need to actually show how those questions are answered otherwise it just comes off as religious pomposity so what you are saying is when we enter into that uh, dialogue. It is, we can't, uh, we, it's not that we are simply going to let them tell us what is the truth, but it's not also that we are going to tell them the truth. We will, it will probably be like a discourse by which we understand how the truth we have can illuminate the situation we are in, the issue that they're discussing. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. And again, a, a great response, you know, a great heritage. Um, we may have some pride in that, but it also brings, you know, um, it brings responsibility. Therefore, in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2, verse, verse 14, when Krishna describes um, Arjuna's parental background by calling him Kanteya and Bharata, I think, 2.14. Mm. Yes. Um, 
he didn't kind of insert those words because there was a lack of syllables and that he had to keep the meter of the line. Um, the Lord is not subject to such constraints, we could surmise. Um, but he did it deliberately, according to Srila Prabhupada, to, to tell Arjuna, that, to inform Arjuna, to instruct Arjuna that, um, you know, a great heritage brings great responsibility in the execution of dharma. Beautiful. So, Prabhu, this is just a couple of questions were remaining. If you want to discuss them now, or we could come to this a little later in our next podcast also. You say the difference between virtues and values, that the, that the discussion of the absolute should start with the self and not God, or the difference between right, wrong and virtue wise. These were issues which uh, I think each of these will require time. Will they come up in the discussion of the moral philosophy? We could discuss it yes. next time then. I think I think I think they will do, but can you hang on to those questions yeah, just in case I don't explicit don't answer them or don't explicitly answer them and you can actually keep them for next time. But I think they will all be discussed again. Perhaps you could send those to me actually at some stage if you don't mind. Sure, sure. And sure, um, sure. and I think we'll 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 then go on to ask I think we've kind of reached the stage where we might be able to discuss what our moral philosophy looks like. Yes, it's a, it's a, I think it's a, it was a necessary build up before we could get into the subject. So, yes, thank you. Bro. So I'll try to summarize. It was a quite a, quite a ride, you can say, the way we discussed today. So broadly, we started with the discussion of the difference between morality and ethics. And then there are different ways in which Sometimes these terms can be used as synonymous because the same word can have different meanings also. But mm. we've differentiated in terms of that primarily it's a, there is a code of conduct which is involved in various areas, sports, eth sports, sports ethics or corporate ethics or something like that. So which is more in terms of the way we function, guidelines for functioning. Then there is, there is the aspect of philosophy which puts various moral guidelines into a holistic framework and it develops the thought systematically. And within that, we can have also um, some specific, some amount of uh, specificity with respect to genres, then it can be environmental ethics, and there can be ethics about various areas. And then at a, there's at also at a hermeneutical level. And then we are building a philosophy which statement means what and which statement is more important, which statement is less important. That is also a part of the ethical discussion. And then in that connection, we also discussed that. So uh, now how, why do we need to discuss that in our movement today instead of just mm -hmm. focusing on spiritual topics? So one reason for that is that we sometimes fall short of our own moral standards. Mm -hmm. And there are issues where we know what is the right what is the right thing to do it's clear but we are unable to stick to that so at one level by the purification that comes from bhakti that 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 gap will be bridged but still it is not automatic it requires conscious uh, observation and intro introspection so just because we say that bhakti will lead to jnana and uh, to knowledge and uh, renunciation and other kind other aspects of dharma proper behavior that doesn't mean these are unimportant that means our bhakti practice should lead to those things and we need to be evaluating whether it is happening or not so mm -hmm. that's why you talk about the cause effect correlation we, we cannot uh, use that to minimize the value of the effects mm -hmm. so then uh, within that point itself we also discussed about how when there is moral shortfall far away from us, then it is uh, it is easy to just, uh, uh, what you said, either rancid criticism or some finger pointing or something like that. It's easy to dismiss that. And But when that moral shortfall happens close to us, say in our own culture, in our own movement, then what do we do? Do we just deny it or do we actually address the issue that is, that is over there? So that's uh, that's an important question, and th in that connection, also with respect to ethical issues, we may not even there are many issues about which we may not be sure what is the right thing. 
So of course, with respect to moral issues, I think you started by mentioning some issues like why is there so much uh, more di- divorce than what is expected in our moment, or mm. there are some issues with leadership with respect to book distribution. So all these are <clears throat> that is that is there could be certain presumptions of of spiritual of acting in a spiritual way because of which the ethical dimension may be undermined, and that's why. we face more problems than we need to in those activities so mm-hmm. with respect to ethics like milk and several other issues whether we take that or not and how we what do we bring into those dis- first what do we as a tradition bring into those discussions so f- oh, you mentioned that there is a systematic division of branches of knowledge within the vedic tradition in general mm-hmm. and especially for leaders you quoted pro quoted prabhupad saying that because krishna balram were kshatriyas they studied ethics mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so so this is uh, something which will help us to become a intelligible part of the mainstream discussion and that's mm-hmm. how we can broaden the reach that we have as a movement so it's required for us both as uh, so so that it's like all preaching is bridging that was a striking point and it's just that for reaching different audiences we may need different kinds of bridges different lengths of bridges so rather than mm. seeing the seeing there is polarity between the next step or the ultimate goal mm. we see that there has to be a synergy between both so liberals may focus more on the next step and mm. conservatives or fundamentalists may focus more on the ultimate goal but mm-hmm. while there is a tension between the two it that can be reconciled by having both like in education there are aims and objectives both so mm-hmm. so just as there is for various areas for leadership for management for edu- education what is our pedagogy what is our philosophy if we have that mm-hmm. developed then we will be able to function better in these areas and then mm-hmm. we also discuss a little bit about virtue ethics uh, as contrasted mm-hmm. with uh, say deontological ethics or or a consequentialist or utilitarian form of ethics so mm-hmm. so broadly the vedic uh, or the bhakti world view the bhagavad gita's world view seems to be uh, important for seems to conform with v- virtue ethics to some extent and mm-hmm. in that connection mention that as devotees we may contemplate you know what would a virtuous person do what would shri prabhupada do in a situation like this and that becomes a guidance for us to act mm-hmm. so towards mm-hmm. the end we discuss that i like that phrase you mentioned that we can't change our inner architecture so mm-hmm. why do we need to engage with mainstream thinkers in today's world because mm-hmm. their thoughts have to some extent shaped who we are so our past is not just a mundane baggage to be given up it's it's mm-hmm. a cultural and moral capital that can be utilized mm-hmm. and uh, that can we can build on it and um, beyond that uh, if we are going to if we are going to bring our scriptural light on this issue it has to go beyond just giving a set of quotes because that when we do that it could just be personal opinion justified by scriptural quotes and there might be a lot of emotivism like uh, we all are human beings so we have you got emotional reactions to particular issues and we find so if you want to go beyond that to reason discussion then uh, you also mentioned this point that just making reason as absolute also is not a solution because like reason was made into god in the post french revolution time reason is important mm-hmm. but it we can't make it all important so mm-hmm. in one sense even reason has to be guided by virtues and the ultimate mm-hmm. virtue we could say is prema so mm-hmm. shraddha is important but different people will get shraddha in different ways so mm-hmm. shraddha can come to somebody by just coming to a temple and seeing the devotees but shraddha can come also by seeing that devotees are able to be a part of the be a respectable part of the mainstream intellectual discussion and are contributing something so mm-hmm. we both for our own practice i think you mentioned that we are not teaching a disembodied spirituality it's very mm-hmm. much society and then you mentioned about relational ethics and rasa which correlates mm-hmm. very much with that that as a virtues are not just in isolation they are actually 
manifested in the interaction that manifested and developed through the interaction through the relationships so I, in that I sense see. not only is that true for our development but the rasa theology also provides us a lot that we can contribute in this discussion yeah so overall the we need a, a moral philosophy which can be there was some amount of ethical we could say moral philosophy in terms of the dharma sutras dharma shastras the manusmriti mm. bhagavad gita in today's world could be more more foundational and mm. its triguna framework could be used to offer some fresh insight to mm. what a working moral philosophy would look like mm. so any other points you would like to add before we conclude prabhu no i think i think you got most of it i'm i highly impressed how you uh, managed to summarize that that lengthy discussion so briefly thank you very much prabhu thank you bro it uh, is and and uh, thank you for this opportunity i i must say um because i'm doing because of the lockdown i'm not doing a lot of teaching and i'm um, doing a lot of studying but uh, the um the opportunity to kind of be able to express some of my thoughts uh, and to have this conversation is very helpful in me clarifying my own thoughts a little more uh, and uh, you know trying to uh, test my own intuition to see whether it's right and or whether it's wrong uh, and to kind of yeah come to a better understanding so i i really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you prabhu in these these difficult times so thank you very much for your time and and having the patience to listen thank you bro i also appreciate the opportunity to have these discussions you know about 10 years ago my spiritual master zona sadhanath maharaj asked me to focus on western outreach so since that i have been reading a lot of western contemporary thinkers and western spiritually oriented thinkers so what it struck me is that uh, uh that the kind of discussions that are going on i there is a complete absence of any of those discussions in in our movement so mm -hmm. like we mm -hmm. talk about privilege and privilege is not the problem abuse of privilege is the problem so you also mm -hmm. address many contemporary issues and mm -hmm. it would be fascinating to discuss uh, you know, what would be the vedic perspective on contemporary issues so like you mentioned yeah. that i one point i forgot us but very important point is that we cannot uh, attribute moral virtue to material designation but at the same mm -hmm. time we cannot uh, say divorce the spiritual culture of krishna consciousness from its indian roots so mm -hmm. that where that balance would be that is a discussion but this but you know you you are not only your what i found fascinating was that uh, that how there are so many areas where the contemporary intellectual debates can interact with with krishna conscious tenets and that has not been done much or even at all i would say not at all but very little it has been done so i also found it very intellectually not just illuminating but also stimulating so i yeah. got light but also got ideas to further that thought so thank you very much for sharing your wisdom and investing your time in these discussions thank That's you all. very much it's really it's really my pleasure thank you prabhu and i look forward to uh, perhaps another podcast if if you are amenable to the idea yes sir certainly thank you okay hari krishna hari bhavo